Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Increasing International Sales to India. My name is Supriya Pandey, and I am a Senior Global Consultant at Amrit. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to go over a few logistical details. If you are logged in, you should see before you the first slide of the presentation. Please do not minimize the screen and confirm that you can see the entire screen on your monitor. You should also see a webinar applet, which will allow you to send us questions throughout the session. The speaker, Gunjan Bagla, will answer the questions either through the course of the session or at the very end. In case you run into any technical issues, please call 1-805-617-7000. You might be asked for a meeting ID, which you can retrieve from the confirmation email we sent you, and it is also available at the bottom of the webinar applet. During the course of the webinar, if time permits, we will be conducting some interactive polls and would really appreciate your participation. If you have any questions after the webinar, you can always email us at usa at amrit.com. Again, that's usa at amrit.com. I would now like to go ahead and introduce our featured speaker. You might know that companies which trust Amrit's India expertise include Boeing, Hewlett Packard, Consberg Automotive, Teneco and Woodward Industries. Our speaker today has helped executives from each of these companies. When the Wall Street Journal and the Harvard Business Review need insights on India, they turn to Gunjan Bagla for comments and articles. When the National Public Radio and BBC TV need a voice or a face who can explain India to the West, they turn again to Gunjan Bagla. His latest piece for the Harvard Business Review appeared just before Christmas entitled how U.S. businesses can succeed in India in 2015. Gunjan has an MBA with honors from Southern Illinois University and a mechanical engineering degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in India. He was president of the Alumni Association of the IITs for three years and is author of the top-rated book, Doing Business in 21st Century India. So now, here's Gunjan. Thank you, Supriya, and welcome to all of you who are joining from the United States, some from Europe, and I see several people from India joining in as well. Uh, this is a great time to be talking about expanding your international sales to India. Uh, you might know that Secretary of State John Kerry was in India on Sunday, and he spoke at the Vibrant Gujarat Summit uh, about uh, the idea of expanding U.S.-India trade dramatically over the next few years. Uh, we'll get into some of the specifics very soon, but you should also know, you haven't seen this in the media very much yet, but President Obama will be making his second trip to India in just about 10 days. Uh, he will be the chief guest at India's large military parade, uh, which is pictured here on the, uh, on the uh, right side of this uh, slide. Uh, he will be at the Republic Day parade on January 26th. There's a good chance that Commerce Secretary Penny Pritzker might join him as well, although we are awaiting that announcement. Uh, several years ago, when President Obama announced the National Export Initiative in an effort to double American exports, I wrote an article for Business Week that uh, the easiest country to do this for would be India. And uh, now they are talking about a much greater increase, which we will get into in a moment. So here's the next slide. Uh, take a look at, at the rate of growth of exports on the purple line. On the left side, you're seeing the rate of growth of goods exports to India, and on the right side is private services, services offered by companies. If you take all countries at 100 base in 2000, you see how India is the breakaway country in terms of expansion of, of exports. Our contention here at Amrit is that this is just the beginning of the curve. There's a lot more potential that we haven't uh, been able to get to for various reasons. And we expect that 2015 will be the turning point uh, where we will see India break out, much as you saw China break out in, in the 90s. If you look back last year, according to US government data, these are the some of the top categories for products being exported to India. So you would expect. Boeing, India's largest, I mean, America's largest exporter, to be a participant with both both its civilian and military aircraft, but petroleum and chemical products and fertilizers and plastics and machines and engines, instruments, medical devices, electrical app apparatus, telecom equipment, 
it, the range goes on and on. And then there's products that we grow in the in this great country of ours: wood and wood pulp, fruits and nuts, uh, Washington apples. You name it. Uh, these are some of the top categories looking at the past. But as we look at the future, virtually any product or service, service that can be exported from the United States would find a market in India. Uh, we've seen an amazing receptivity to American brands, American companies, and American products and services. So I'll be happy to answer questions from any of you about your specific products and industries to the extent that, that we can talk about in a public forum. And then, of course, I'm happy to take private questions from you by email later on. So why is there so much excitement about India right now? This slide tries to capture some of the, some of the reasons. If you look at the pictures, you will see that Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, was in India just a few months ago. And a few weeks before that, Sheryl Sandberg, his chief operating officer, was there in India. Now today, Facebook, Facebook gets almost no revenue from India. It's probably less than 1% of its overall revenue coming from India. But the reason that the two top officers went there is they know that the future is going to be very different. The other pictures you see are, are Jeff Immel, the CEO of General Electric. Uh, he, he met the Indian Prime Minister, Naren Modi, pictured on the right, uh, when uh, Mr. Modi was in New York City in, uh, to attend the UN General Assembly. You see a uh, picture of Jim McNerney, the CEO of Boeing and uh, of Lloyd Blankfein, the uh, uh, CEO or uh, managing director of Goldman Sachs. So top, top American companies in all sectors are very keen to look at India. And I just showed you four pictures. We could have filled this entire slide with other pictures of, of, of American CEOs who have been very keen to expand their investment in India. I've got a couple of other examples. Allstate has agreed to invest more than a billion dollars in India. SoftBank, the Japanese venture capital firm, committed to investing $10 billion over the next decade and started immediately in October with investing $1 billion in, uh, in Indian uh, online companies. If you look at the computer market in India, it is led not by Lenovo but by Dell and HP. If you look at household appliances such as washers and dryers, Whirlpool, an American company, is doing extremely well. Uh, facing up to competition from Chinese companies like Hire and Korean companies like LG and Samsung. So there's a tremendous range of companies that are succeeding in India. The future is going to be much better, as I said, and that's because India now welcomes investment from overseas. It is already the third largest recipient of foreign direct investment next to the United States and China, but the liberalization that they've, they've uh, uh, started on will accelerate this pace. The other thing that I think you need to realize compared to China is that Indian consumers, Indian companies, and Indian, Indian government officials are much more friendly towards the US than officials from Russia or Brazil or China. And so there's, there's a degree of goodwill towards the United States that you don't find existing in other countries. And Partly because of that, partly because of these financial trends, Goldman Sachs now predicts that in 2016, India's growth rate will cross China. Now, India's economy is much smaller than China's today. So they're just talking about the growth rate, not the size of the economy. My contention to all of you on the phone is that uh, the decisions that you make across last year and this year will create a winning lead for you. And the executives who make those decisions will benefit from the success in their career path within the companies. So here's, here's one example from just down the street from where I'm sitting in Cerritos, California, is the factory for uh, Boeing where they make the C-17 transport aircraft. And this is one of the ones that was shipped to India. India is now the largest operator of the C-17 aircraft next only to the US Air Force. They bought 10 of these planes and they have a right to buy more if necessary. So this was a $4 billion order pay, paid for by Indian taxpayers funding jobs right here in Southern California where I live. It's not just large companies, however, that are benefiting. On the, on the bottom left, you have a picture of uh, products made by one of our smaller clients, Trigicon. These guys make uh, the sights that go on to rifles and guns that are used by police and soldiers, and they've had tremendous success with our guidance in taking their product to Indian security forces, and they expect to continue to do so for, for a number of years. 
Uh, Gunjan, this might be a good time to conduct our first poll and get a sense of the audience. Sure, go ahead, Supriya. Okay, so I'll be launching a poll. Uh, please take a moment and um, answer just so that Gunjan as a speaker has a better sense of uh, uh, your experience. And again, what I would like to remind everyone, um, please do send us any questions you have. Uh, Gunjan uh, answers them throughout the session. Uh, if you have questions that come up from the slides or questions you might have had before you came to the presentation, um, and we will make sure that they get answered um, at some point. Again, please take just a couple more minutes. Um, we're doing pretty well. We're just expecting a few more folks to answer, and we shall go ahead and close the poll. Okay. You will need to show the results. I, I, I have. I have. I have. Do you not see it, Gunjan? I, I don't see them. You have to read them. Oh, okay. So um, basically, uh, the question is, how much time have you spent in India doing business since 2010? Uh, we have 45% uh, uh, who have answered none. Uh, nobody has done less than 10 days. 15% um, 11 to 30 days, 30% more than 30 days, and 10% uh, I live in India. Terrific. Okay. So most people have very limited experience being in India, and I'll use that as my baseline. For those of you who live in India who have spent more time, please bear with me. And if you have any advanced questions, I will take care of those as well. Now the slide that we are looking at, I, I can, can, can you hide the poll and show the yeah, slide? Yeah, it's, it's, it's done. Good job. Yeah. All right. So this slide was, is adapted from an article in The Economist where they looked at many major companies by the percentage of their market value that is attributed to revenue in India. And so you see at the top of the list are companies such as Suzuki of Japan, which interestingly is not a big player in the motorcycle market in India, but 59% of their total market value of Suzuki of Japan comes from selling cars in the Indian market. You look at British American Tobacco, and they are the principal owner of a company called ITC in India, which is very big in consumer products, in shipping, in, 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 in paper, and of course in cigarettes. You look at Unilever, one of the largest consumer product companies, and 15% of their market value comes from their Indian revenue. And the list goes on and on. Now, you'll notice that there's not a lot of American companies on the list. In fact, the, the one with the largest share of its market value coming from India is Cummins from Indiana. Now, they've been in India a while, and there's some excellent case studies describing how they have adapted and succeeded in the Indian market. Uh, there's a picture on the right which shows one of their factories making engines in, in the city of Pune in, in uh, Western India. Uh, GE has a good chunk of their revenue coming from India, although they don't disclose the percentages. Much of their products are manufactured in the U.S. and then shipped to India, uh, to going to the power plants and uh, to, to many, many other facilities. So our expectation is that by 2020 or sooner, India will be a $500 billion trading partner with, with America. And when you look at absolute numbers, sometimes it's hard to tell what that means. But I want to remind you that just a few years ago, India's trade with the US was just $20 billion. From $20 billion, it has grown to $100 billion in about five years. And now they're looking at a 5x growth over the next, next five or six years. Last year, India became the third largest economy in purchasing power parity after the US and China. It overtook Japan, and its GDP is now about $2 trillion. It's a large country with lots of people, 1.2 billion, the second most populous country in the world. But the most interesting point you should recognize is that more than half of its population is below age 25. So it's a large country, but a young country. And it is urbanizing rapidly. About 60 million people live in the largest six cities. I won't go through all of the other points listed here. The pictures on the right show the uh, Bandra Worli Sea Link Bridge in Mumbai and the Delhi Metro. If you are ever in Delhi, you should take a moment uh, sometime outside of rush hour to ride the metro system in Delhi. It is a modern train system that has transformed the national capital. And now they are putting in similar metro, metro train systems across the major cities of India. So we'll now get into the very specifics of the four Ps of marketing applied to India, and we'll talk about uh, 
about uh, each of them. Uh, Supriya, can you run the next poll? Yes, Indian. I'm just going to do that. So again, everyone, uh, running another poll, uh, please answer. And uh, I'll close it as soon as we have enough responses. So um, we have uh, Debushi is asking, is it a right time is it, uh, to consider a manufacturing facility in India, or is it better to start with a business office in India to begin with? Okay, that's a great question. And the nature of the question implies that they are just getting started with their sales in India. If they're just getting started with the sales, I would be conservative. Our general recommendations in India is to make, uh, to make sure that you can validate a market. Uh, before you invest a good chunk of money on the ground. There are some exceptions to that because of local content requirements or transportation costs or other reasons, uh, duties, import duties, and so on, where it makes sense to start with a manufacturing facility from day one. But generally, we advise people to be conservative and validate the market, even if you have to uh, subsidize some of the initial sales to India, just to make sure that the Indian companies or consumers are going to buy your product. But once you've done that, then it becomes clear about the size of the facility that you want to put up, as well as the location. India is a big country, uh, and you want to be sure that you don't end up locating the factory in the wrong part of the country. So these are factors to consider. The other factor to consider is that when you're locating a manufacturing facility in India, keep in mind that the current prime minister has a big push called Make in India. And they really want to go head to head with China in competing with manufacturing capabilities on the ground in India. This is, it's too early to say how successful this will be. We have good reason to believe that there will be tremendous success to this initiative. But one of the things you have to factor is, can you use India as a base for selling products into other markets, not just India? If that's the case, then you want to locate closer to the ports. If not, maybe you can consider an inland location. So some of these things may not be clear, to Debashi's company if they are just getting started uh, in terms of the relative ratios. So my advice, generally speaking, would be to be conservative, but to look closely at the option of manufacturing in India. So let's go ahead and close the polls, and if you can share the results, Supriya. Yes, it's already done, Gunjan. I'm surprised you can't see it today. Uh, so the answers are, um, the question was, which emerging markets are most important to you this year? And 57% uh, have said India. 14% China, 14% Brazil, and 14% other countries. OK, terrific, terrific. OK, all right. So let's, let's talk about the question that many people come, to, uh, come with to us when they are getting started, when they make their first contact. I'd say about 40% of the people new to India come to us with these three magic words. They want our help to do this, okay. to select a distributor. The typical call is, hey, we've got an email from lots of potential partners. Help us choose which one is the right partner. Okay. And so how many potential mistakes are embedded in these three words? Okay. Uh, you, I'm not asking this question as a poll, but just think about it. Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? How many mistakes? Okay. My contention is that there are potentially three mistakes, one in each of the words. And let me walk you through that. So. Assuming that you need a distributor in India, uh, you know, maybe right for some people, but many, many of our clients have chosen to sell their products directly into India. Some of, some, for some companies, it makes sense if it's a high value enough item or you just have a limited number of customers to actually have a US or overseas based salesperson make multiple trips uh, to, to help close the sale. One of our clients is in the nuclear energy business, and that's exactly what we've recommended to them, because there's exactly one customer called the Nuclear Power Corporation of India, and it makes sense for them to travel you know, two or three times to India to help close that sale. I've got other examples here of companies that have done that that are not our clients. Um, the next level is where you might just have one salesperson. You, you, know, you don't even have any infrastructure. The salesperson may even be working out of their home. For one of our automotive clients, this is exactly what we recommended because they were really looking for three or four OEM clients over a five-year period. So each OEM client would drive 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars of business for them. This approach worked very well for this client, and now they've added more salespeople after getting that initial success. 
Now, some of our clients have gone all in and set up a joint venture or a subsidiary. And that's also a reasonable approach. In some cases, it may make sense to do that from day one. There's also another approach where you don't set up anything at all. You find an Indian company or a multinational company, for that matter, who understands India, and you simply license your product, your technology, or your manufacturing capabilities to them, and you make money by selling your intellectual property without having any infrastructure on the ground in India. All of these are valid approaches, and I would say that uh, uh, the people who approach us, many, many can benefit from India using one of these approaches rather than a distributor. This is not to say there's anything wrong with having a distributor, but we should not prematurely jump to the conclusion that that is the best solution for India. So I've got an example of, uh, of a client that made currency recognition machines, you know, the kind of things that you might, you might see at a, at a train station or at a, on a candy machine uh, where you can put in uh, money and it recognizes the dollars or, or, pen, or, or uh, quarters that you put in. Uh, they wanted to sell their systems in India that would be integrated into other machines. And when we examine their end customer buying pattern, looking at uh, OEMs, looking at small integrators, looking at some governments who would be responsible for buying the systems for uh, train, train uh, metro, suburban and uh, local train systems, we realize that one distributor just wouldn't do the trick for these people. And our recommendation was to have a sales direct team driven out of Europe for the uh, train and metro system. And we recommended a couple of small distributors, rather than the large distributor they had been talking to, to focus on the OEMs and uh, we organized them by, by uh, vertical. Finally, for the very small system integrators, we went with a catalog type of company that essentially had uh, an order taking approach rather than a demand generation approach. So even though their sales objectives in India were not huge, the only way to address their diverse market was through a multi-channel strategy. And, uh, and that's not unusual depending on the needs of the client and the India market situation in particular. So the second word that I want to attack is the word A, select A distributor. You know, people say, well, I have a distributor in New Zealand, I have a distributor in Taiwan, let me get a distributor in India. Well, the problem with that is that India's population exceeds that, or that of all of Europe. And what's more is that it's a very diverse country. You wouldn't be selling in Sweden like you sell in Greece, and you wouldn't be selling in Portugal like you sell in Latvia. The same thing is true of, of the Indian state. And there are many, many reasons uh, why you want to consider the idea of having multiple distributors. And I want to differentiate between the idea of an importer and a distributor. You may have a single entity that imports your product into India and has the regulatory licenses and all of that to do so and pays the duty if necessary. But the distribution in many cases may be handled by two, three, five, twenty different entities that take your product and move it physically from the point of, from the port of receipt to the end customer. Uh, this may be different for you compared to other countries where you have entered, but this is the nature of India where very few distributors have a large, uh, large national scale. And uh, some that do may not consider your product to be important enough to promote vigorously. So keep this in mind. And finally, the word select seems to imply that we have a list of people who have contacted us and uh, one of those must be the right solution. And again, we find at least 50% of the time that the right solution might be somebody who has, who's so successful in selling within India that they haven't taken the time to contact you. The people who are sending inquiries on your website, who are running around at trade shows meeting you, might be those who don't really have enough wherewithal to make those sales in India for you. Uh, this, again, is not always the case, but what I'm saying is that it is, it would be unfair to enter the Indian market without doing a, a, a closer look, without taking a closer look at uh, the uh, potential of uh, distributors, channel partners, JV partners who might not have contacted you. And again, US companies are somewhat behind, as you saw on the earlier slide, compared to Europeans and Asian companies. So some of the very well-known brands in the US may not be as well-known in, in India, and this is part of the reason why you have to do this. 
let's move on to uh, beyond the uh, distribution side to the product. And here's a short story about a client whose product we tweaked to be able to adjust to the Indian market. These guys had been in India for a short time and their sales in year two were way below what their projection was. Uh, they couldn't quite understand why. So they hired us to look at this and we found very quickly that their pricing was appropriate for the Indian market. They'd done the right thing as far as advertising and promotion. Uh, they had appointed a limited number of distributors, but their sales plan had considered that because again, they were being conservative in going to India. But what was happening was that people would buy the product and then they wouldn't get very many repeat purchases. And we discovered this through some of our intuitive analysis, but then we went out and conducted focus groups uh, in, in uh, four cities. And we found that indeed this was a case that consumers had a little bit of a distaste for this particular product. And we found that it could be easily adjusted. In fact, the, the, the great thing was that it could be adjusted by simply removing one of the components of the product. By removing that component, they actually saved in the material cost while at the same time increasing sales. So it became a win-win situation, but they had to create a special set of SKUs for the Indian market because their standard off-the-shelf product just would not have worked. So it, the, the message really for you is that you want to make your product and your, your, your product approach a very specific to India. Dunkin Donuts just did that recently. They entered the Indian market, and donuts will probably account for less than 50% of their sales, donuts and coffee, in fact. Uh, they are going to have vegetable sandwiches, and they've actually changed the name of the chain just for India. It will be called Dunkin Donuts and more. Uh, so uh, if you visit India, try to look for them. Uh, they'll be in some of the major cities this year. Now let's take a company in a completely different business, Medtronic, the world's largest independent uh, 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 medical device maker. When they entered India uh, some years ago, they had some limited success, but about two years ago they decided that one way to increase business in India was to offer some of their devices on installment payment as it's called in India, on credit as you would say in this country. So you can get a stand and pay for it over, the, over a three-year period or something of that nature. And this has worked well for them. So there are many, many reasons why you may want to modify the product to meet the preferences of Indian companies and Indian consumers. And again, we won't get into all the specifics, but the, this, is, this is one important takeaway if you want to succeed in India. Let's now switch to advertising. And again, I want to start with an example that, you know, that might almost seem incongruous to many of you on the phone. Uh, could you imagine Leonardo DiCaprio advertising concrete in this country? The celebrity endorsements are typically uh, uh, related to high-end consumer brands, but in India, one of India's largest movie, you know, biggest movie stars, he's been he's been a perpetual star for the last 30 years, in fact, uh, uh, and he is the face of Pinani Cement. Uh, he's featured on television ads, on billboards, on print media, all over the place, and this is quite mainstream in India. Celebrity endorsements of, of various kinds. Advertising in India can take some quirky and unusual forms, and I have a couple that I want to describe to you. On the left is an uh, is a award-winning campaign by Penguin Books, and the pictures that you see, uh, they're not acrobats, they're actually uh, simulations of headphones, and so you have Mark Twain and Oscar Wilde, and then the little picture of William Shakespeare whispering into your ear if you buy one of the Penguin Books about them, and this wasn't an audio book ad, by the way, it was just an ad for the, uh, the the print versions of the books. Uh, this this was a runaway success, and it, it won many international awards. Um, on the right is a wide-angle lens company, a, a, a camera lens company called Omax. And when you look at those ads, you might find them slightly sexist, perhaps even slightly offensive in the American context. Uh, what they're really saying is uh, this guy has a narrow narrow angle lens and so he's missing the beautiful women in his pictures. Uh, there was a whole series of them and uh, they, they also were very much appreciated by the advertising community worldwide. It in, did quite well in India a few years ago. If you Google the name of this company and, and adver advertising, you'll see a whole series of ads and 
uh, that, that you can find online. In, in the US, we normally don't have politics or religion in our, in our advertising, but in India you will find many examples of that as well. So keep in mind that if you're going to set up a PR and promotion and advertising strategy, you can't simply duplicate what you have in the US and some of the assumptions you might have about India in terms of what works and what doesn't work might actually be challenged by some of the realities that we see happening in India today. Let's uh, jump to the idea about pricing, but before we do that, can we run a, another poll? Yes, yeah. sure, Gunjan. I have it ready and launching it here. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, Gunjan. I think we have most people's answers. Can you read the question and the answers? Yes. So the question is, how would you characterize your sales in India? And um, we have 24% who are considering the idea. 29% say we have limited sales in India with plans to grow. 24% say that India sales are an important part of our company's success. 10% uh, say that uh, we have an India subsidiary, factory, or joint venture, and 14% uh, it's uh, not applicable. So they're pretty evenly divided. We can't focus on one or the other. Already. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, We're we back have the, the slide. price slide up? Yes. Terrific. So when Secretary of State John Kerry was in India on Sunday, he actually took time to visit the new Ford factory in the state of Gujarat where they manufacture some of the cars in India for the Indian market as well as for export to over 30 countries. Ford has multiple factories in India. The one in, uh, in Gujarat is one of their newest. They also have a factory in Pune and I believe one in Chennai. Uh, what is, Ford has been in India for the longest time. But for a while, all they were manufacturing were tractors in a contract with in a, in a joint venture. And they got into the automotive business just a few years ago. Uh, they realized early on that they needed to adapt to the Indian market, looking at the runaway success of companies such as Suzuki of Japan, which I told you about earlier. So what they did was they designed a car specifically for the Indian market, marketed in India as the FIGO. And it's a very small car, as you can see. Uh, the price point is about $7,000. And the success of this car has been tremendous. It has also helped the sales of their compact SUV, which you see pictured on the bottom right. The CEO of Ford is now committed to spending over a billion dollars to use India as a manufacturing hub. Uh, now, Ford is not the first car company to do this. Hyundai, the Korean company, already made such a commitment, uh, perhaps not to the size of a billion dollars, but they began manufacturing cars in Tamil Nadu and shipping them to Africa and Europe from the Indian factory. And there are some cars that Hyundai only manufactures in India for worldwide sale. Uh, they've shut down the manufacturing lines in Korea for some of those lines. So uh, the, the message here is that if you price your product correctly and you adapt it to the Indian market, you can have tremendous success. GM has also had some success in India, although I would say that uh, the Asian and the European companies in the car market are a little bit ahead of the US companies. Chrysler is not, not much of a player right now. All right, so do we have uh, questions that we can take at this point? Um, yes, Gunjan. Uh, we have one question that has come up um, about sort of comparing India to China. Uh, Ellen is asking, isn't India very similar to China as a market? I think that's, that's a great question. And I think many American companies today, when they look at the Indian market, uh, particularly if they are new to it, they see that it's a large country across the Pacific Ocean. And it has you know over a billion people. And it's been started growing recently, you know, relatively recently. And so they have tend to apply some of the lessons that they learned in China into India. And this is probably one of the greatest reasons for missteps and stumbles in India. Uh, because almost everything you learn in China, this does not translate to India. Uh, beyond the fact that these are two large countries across the Pacific Ocean, 
the similarity is pretty much stark there. India is very much US friendly. Uh, there's not the degree of suspicion between the two countries as there is between China and the US. India has a free press, which is good if you're trying to promote your product and you're trying to, to, uh, to do PR and so on. It's also something to watch for if you fall afoul of uh, environmental laws or if you do something that uh, the Indian press might feel that like as a foreign company you shouldn't be doing. So you have to watch for that. India has a stock market whose history goes back 120 years. And so you can set up a subsidiary in India that gets publicly traded in India very easily. And you can raise money in India for your subsidiary. Colgate has done that. Uh, many, many other com American companies have Indian subsidiaries that are traded on the Indian stock exchange very readily in an open manner in a very modern exchange. Um, many Indian executives will speak English. So if you go to do business with the Indian government, uh, you go to any mid-sized or large company, you will find that you can speak in English with them, which is great compared to China. But I'll get to this point in a little bit uh, in, in a couple of slides, that the English they speak may not be quite the same as the English that you're used to. Uh, and, and what I say is that Indians think American, uh, Indians don't think American. So that's what you have to watch for. Whereas in China, you're always working through a translator and interpreter, and you know that they don't understand what you're saying. So there are many, many reasons why you should consider India and China as very, very different. Shall we also run our final poll at this point? Uh, sure, Gunjan. And we do have a, a few questions that have come up, so um, we can answer that as well. But I will go ahead and run our last poll, I believe. So um, sort of tying to uh, the last uh, question, Gunjan, we have a question from John asking about uh, how strong is the influx of uh, uh, cheap Chinese-made products. Um, and he's asking, if uh, is the average native of India interested more in price or high quality, reasonable price, good value? OK, so let's take each question one at a time. Let me start with the second question. So. In a country of 1.2 billion people, where you have some of the world's richest people living and many of the world's poorest people living, I find that averages can only mislead. So I don't tend to recommend anything for our clients that's based on averages. It's really driven by the product and service you offer. Are there enough people in that segment in India to buy that product or service? Uh, and, 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 and you will find that pretty much every market segment right now has demand for American products. So you could, be, you could be Louis Vuitton and you can sell your products in India. And you can be, uh, you can be a discount generic uh, drugs manufacturer and you'll find that there's a market in India but there's an Indian company competing with you very vigorously. So across the board, at every price point, at every quality level, there is a demand. What there is not is the assumption that if you have a product optimized for American customers, whether they are companies, governments, or, or, or consumers, that all of the things that American consumers or companies value will automatically translate into value in India. And that's why a lot of people who take their products to India end up saying, hey, the Indian, Indian customer is only interested in price, not in value. They're interested in value, but they're interested in value on their terms, not value on the terms of somebody who lives in Detroit or Phoenix. And so, for example, labor rates in India are, are relatively low. So maintenance costs and repair costs are not as much of a factor if you're selling a machine into India. And if you've designed it in such a way that downtime is much, much lower, you better have a good production reason rather than a low labor cost of repair kind of reason. So you have to understand the, the, the drivers of decision making in India. Uh, cash flow is king in India. And in the US, we are used to much easier credit. Uh, uh, interest rates are lower here than, than, than in India. And so an Indian executive buying a piece of equipment or buying product has to consider all of these factors in making their decision. The American companies who adapt to these kinds of considerations, such as Cummins has done, such as many, many other, other American companies have done, find tremendous success. 
Okay, can you uh, repeat the question, uh, the second part of the question, to be sure I answered it fully? Um, sure, Rindan, hold on one minute. Um, I guess the second part was that is the average native of India interested more on price or high quality, reasonable price, like a good value? Yeah, so I would say they're more interested in high quality for a reasonable price, but high quality by their definition and reasonable price by their definition, not by American definition. And can you read the first part of the question? Uh, yeah, it was how strong is the influx of cheap Chinese-made products. Uh, John was asking specifically when it comes to solar and uh, off-grid solar products. Uh, but that's a very, you know, you can maybe um, take that offline later on. So in India, India has doesn't have country-specific uh, quotas or limitations of any kind for the most part. India was a founding member of the World Trade Organization. And so Chinese companies have equal access to the market as as American companies or European companies. And absolutely, there's a tremendous amount of Chinese product available in India, in solar as well as other fields. Uh, this does not mean that American products aren't being successful. In fact, uh, uh, just yesterday, I was reading an article about how a $4 billion project using American products has been sanctioned in, in the states of Gujarat and Rajasthan to build out uh, solar power. Uh, solar uh, utility scale solar perhaps. Uh, there's plenty of American companies that are having success in India, but they face the same kind of competition that they do in the US. So I don't think that you can consider China, that uh, the Chinese won't be there in India. I was at a solar trade show about three years ago and uh, certainly the floors were lined with both American and Chinese companies. Uh, there are plenty of U.S. companies that are succeeding well against Chinese competition. So I would not, I would not hesitate from going into India because of that reason. Great, thank you, Gunjan. And I have closed the poll. Uh, the question was, what might be your company's biggest challenge to success in India? We have 21% 21, 21 say that it's finding the right business partners, distributors, etc. 47% feel that it's reaching the right potential customers. 26% say it's charging a price that India, Indians can afford and make a profit. 0% uh, feel any difficulty of travel is an issue. And 5% uh, say um, other, so. Okay, got it. All right, so what is the largest group? Uh, it's reaching the right potential customers. Got it, okay, all right. I think I've addressed uh, so the issues that, that would relate to this question, but I'll be happy to take on follow-ons as we go on. Mm -hmm. So let's move to the final stretch of the webinar. And I almost wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review entitled, How to Fail in India. Uh, the editors decided that it was too negative sounding a title, but the webinar, I have the liberty to share this with you. So there are three quick ways to fail in India. First of all is the assumption if you do some study about India and you read all the marketing literature put out by Indian media, Indian, corporate India, and uh, even American media, uh, you might get the impression that everybody in India speaks English. So you should have an easy time traveling from New York or Chicago to India, and uh, uh, you should uh, you you will be able to understand how people communicate. So my, my message to you is that while you will understand the words and the sentences, the paragraphs and the themes under this may not be clear to you. So uh, another way to, to put this, as I as I've said before in this call, is that Indians don't think American. Their decision criteria, their things that they value, uh, the way that they communicate indirectly rather than directly are very, very different. So you have to keep that in mind. Very often our clients will have one of our senior India people accompany them to business meetings, to meetings with the government, not because they need a translator of language, but they need a translator of culture and intent. They need a translator of someone when, when an Indian official or an Indian customer says, yes, we are interested, does that mean, yes, we are interested and we want to buy your product or permit you to sell in India? Or does it simply mean, yes, you can stop talking so that I can move on to my next uh, appointment? That difference is very hard for an American visiting India for the first time or even the second or third time to be able to tell. Uh, there are many, many instances where 
major deals have fallen into trouble in the, in, on the business side as well as the political side where one party did not fully understand the other. So this is something to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind if you're selling a consumer product is that only about 100 million of the 1.2 billion people in India are truly fluent in English. You see a lot of products on the shelves that they, and stores that are only marked in English and that's because it's inconvenient to write 29 different languages. I have an example of that of a thousand rupee currency note here. You see what they have to do with all the different languages, the 13 different scripts that they have to write 1,000 rupees in. And, uh, and, and then there are about 23 official languages and over 200 dialects in India. So in the consumer business, you have to be very careful about that. But even on the business side, you have to understand that, uh, that there's a great deal of a gap in the way that your customer or your business partner or the Indian government or regulators might think compared to the way you do. The second failing, and this, this is true mostly of American companies rather than other foreign companies entering India, is that most American companies of any size will have a few people of Indian origin on their staff. And so I often get a call from poor Jay or Vijay or Ravi at, um, at an American company who says, help, my boss thinks I know India. You know, I came here to do my graduate education and I've never worked in India or I worked in India 10 or 15 years ago and now they've given me this assignment. I, I really don't know how to deal with India. All my work experience, all my knowledge of practices is, is, is American. So you have to keep in mind that the right person to deal with India may not necessarily be the Indian on your staff. They might be. But the flip side of this is that India is a diverse, complex, and open society. So somebody who has had no experience to India, with India, somebody who is willing to learn and be open can do just as well in India as somebody with an open mind, as a, somebody of an Indian origin who doesn't have that open mind. So we, we recommend for our clients to be very careful in selecting the people who will interact with India. It's the personality and it's the openness and it's the humility that's far more important. In fact, perversely, Indian people will sometimes in India will have an expectation that somebody who looks like them may also think like them. And so the Indian American returning to India sometimes has a harder time doing business because people make assumptions about what he or she might be thinking. Uh, and that can be very frustrating to Indian Americans who are, you know, who are thrust into this role. So uh, my, my advice is evaluate the individual carefully, prepare them, and make sure that, uh, that they are ready to deal with the complexities of India. The final point, and this is much more true in 2015 than it ever was before, is that the time to enter India or the time to expand your India business is now. If you wait a couple or three years, you will find that all of your other competitors from other countries are there already. You will find that Indian companies are establishing themselves very strongly and that you will have a much harder, harder time taking off. My favorite example of this is Starbucks coffee. About 10 years ago, they announced an initiative to launch in India and then they, they, they pedaled back. They did this three times in a row. In the meantime, an Indian chain called Cafe Coffee Day had studied the way Starbucks sold premium coffee very successfully and the social you know, nature of the way they sold coffee and they replicated that model in India. There's nothing proprietary about it. Uh, they now have over a thousand outlets in India. Starbucks finally partnered with a large Indian company and entered the Indian market. I think they have five or six outlets right now. Their plan over the next next five or two, five years or so is about 50 outlets uh, and I think where I'm sitting in Cerritos, California, I probably have 50 Starbucks outlets within a 10-mile drive of me. So India will not, you know, even in their most optimistic projections, will not be a major market for them. And that's primarily because they sat it out for too long. Uh, I would urge you uh, that if you're going to think of getting to India at all, that, uh, that you look very closely at it and not wait for too long. So let's flip that and let's talk about the markers of success in India. And the three prime ones that stick out in my mind are number one, that you've got to prepare. There's never enough preparation for going to India. Uh, 
most of your work, if you're going to spend, you know, if you're going to India for the first time, as 45% of the people on this webinar might be doing at some point, that most of the work for success in India is actually done before you get on that plane. And I'd say, as I talk to people who are naive about India, who have gone there, they typically they didn't do enough preparation. They relied too much on their partners or their distributor or the US commercial department or whatever to think that everything would be taken care of. Now other people can help you, but the final responsibility is yours in preparing fully. So that's really important. The second thing which I alluded to a little bit earlier in response to that one question from Ellen is that you really should not be looking at what you learned in China as any guide to what will happen in India. India is a complex and diverse country. It's very textured. It's a democracy. It's a pro-American country. There are some small elements that are very vocal that don't like America, but I'd say 90% of, of, uh, of, of Indians, and the survey by the Pew Center confirms this, 90% of Indians have a positive view of the United States. Whereas for the Chinese, I think the number is much lower. For the Russians, it's much lower. Brazilians also, it's, it's moderate. Uh, so you have many, many, many reasons why uh, the Indian customer looks at you differently than, than customers in other countries. And finally, because India is a complex society, uh, you will find that success in India is never a sprint. It's always a marathon. Uh, very often when you go to India for the first time, people will ask you at the end of the meeting, well, when is the next time you're coming back? And if the answer is, I don't know or never, then chances are that you will probably not be as successful in India as you could be. So you should plan on this as a multi-year process. We do, in the advice we give to our clients, we want them to take graduated steps so that they don't overcommit their resources to India and they, they, they have some moderate success before they make larger investments of time and people and, uh, and effort. Uh, but uh, the, the big successes you see in India, uh, companies such as Cummins, companies such as L'Oreal and Amway and, and IBM and, and GE have all spent considerable time in India and been patient uh, to, to be able to get to that point. So we come to the end of our presentation right now. Uh, for those of you who are interested in more information, uh, you can drop an email to usa at amrit.com and we'll send you out a copy of my article that appeared in the Harvard Business Review just a couple of weeks ago, entitled, How American Businesses Can Succeed in India in 2015. So it's very timely and relevant. Uh, if you register on our website, there's papers that you can download, and we keep putting up more information all the time. And of course, if you have specific questions uh, relating to our services, this is not a selling webinar at all. This is just meant for education. But if you have specific questions about your company, uh, send us some details about what you want, and we can arrange a phone call for one of us to talk to you. But at this point, I want to take the remainder of the questions. Uh, Supriya? Yes. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions. I'm going to go through them as fast as I can. Uh, the first one is from Andrew, who has also requested um, a meeting or a call with you, and we can set that up after this. Um, his question uh, pertains to payment options. Uh, he, there's, I guess, a fear of not getting paid, and the most common methods of payment, letter of credit, documentary collections, etc., don't always work. So do you recommend payment options, and uh, do you work with companies uh, so that they can you know, help facilitate uh, these transactions? and uh, protect both the importers and exporters? Yeah, that's a great question. And for anybody new to doing business in India, I think selling your product or service and getting paid for it are, are, should really be the same question. You haven't made a sale. If you don't get paid for it, that's actually much worse than, than not selling the product. So we, we are very conservative in our recommendations about dealing with that. And you know, you can't simply go to a DNB a report for, for an Indian company and I hope to gather sufficient information about them. Uh, so evaluating the financial creditworthiness and the dependability of the people who are going to pay you is very important. Uh, you can, in many cases, ask for advance payment. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you can justify it, you can ask for a substantial advance. Uh, that often works as well. If there are instances where you have to extend credit beyond that, then it's something that you want to evaluate very carefully. Uh, we've had a 
number of clients come to us who extended credit in India when really there was no call to do so. It might expected that any Indian customer will ask you for credit, but then it's up to you as the company doing the business deal whether you do want to extend that credit. Uh, so this is something that during the discovery process and figuring out the ecosystem that we can evaluate very readily and give you recommendation based on on the ground work with the prospective customers. And there will be some business we may tell you to walk away from if we feel that the, uh, the uh, particular customer is not credit worthy or is not reliable. And this is no different from what you would do in the United States. I think sometimes there is some kind of assumption that just because they are far away and I have less visibility that I need to do less due diligence. In fact, the opposite is true. You do need to do more due diligence and you can't rely on uh, on uh, structured reports from, from companies such as DNB, which is, by the way, DNB is active in India, but we've seen that uh, they're not, the data that you get from them is not as reliable, and sometimes there is no data from them. Okay, thank Andrew, you. Andrew, if you have anything, for uh, any follow-on on that, it will be best to put in an email, because I don't know what business you are in and what your prior uh, background is in dealing with India, but we can take that offline. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Nick who's asking what is the percentage of growth uh, what percentage of growth of companies are coming to India from the US what percentage are coming from the US I, I guess what he I think what he means is what he's implying is compared to con companies from Europe versus right. Asia Japan whatever mm -hmm. what percentage are American Right. This varies by industry. Historically, American companies weren't really interested in India at all. So if you ask me the question 20 years ago, the answer was very simple. You know, very few American companies were going there. But today, most European companies of any size are well established in India, as are many Korean, Japanese, and Chinese companies. So if I look at the, the new traffic coming to India, American companies are probably disproportionately represented. Uh, uh, the one place where this becomes extremely clear because there's a small number of customers and you can see this is the defense business. In, in the year 2001, there was almost no defense business going on between the US and India. And the first sale of, uh, of weapon locating radars happened with Raytheon by, uh, just a few months after 9-11. Uh, it was a small sale by defense standard, $150 million or so. And very soon after that, Indian, the Boeing and Lockheed and others began addressing the Indian market aggressively. And today, the US has overtaken Russia, the UK, France, Israel, as and become the largest supplier of defense equipment to India. Uh, I mentioned the C-17s, India bought the P-8s, India bought, uh, is buying Apache helicopters, uh, is buying the C-130 uh, transport aircraft. Uh, Sikorsky recently made a sale of uh, helicopters, so a whole range of equipment. Yeah. So the trend is far more American than it used to be. But again, these questions are more interesting, I think, when you look at your own industry. If you're not in defense, what I'm saying is probably meaningless uh, to you. Uh, so we've got to look at your particular industry. And if for those sending questions now, and I'll stay on as long as I need to, uh, but uh, do, do tell me a little bit about your industry so perhaps I can characterize the question more more appropriately. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, then we have a question from David. Uh, he's asking, you know, specifically again in relationship to uh, an IP law firm. Uh, they're exploring business opportunities to export their services. Um, and he's asking, do you see opportunities for U.S. service companies in India? So for U.S. service companies, yes. In fact, one of the one of the great myths about outsourcing from India is that it's a one-way street where the only thing that happens in the service business is that American companies outsource call centers and tech support and, and customer service to India. There's a lot of that going on. But there's an equal amount of, almost equal amount of business, a substantial business of Indian companies asking for American services. Some of the fields where this is very active are is professional engineering services. Bechtel, the world's largest engineering and construction company, uh, based here in California, 
at one time had 3,500 engineers working on a refinery project in Western India. Uh, you look at uh, most of the large engineering and construction firms, and they have a thriving business supporting the growth of in India's industry and economy. Uh, you look at architects, uh, and, and it's the same thing. Many of India's most iconic buildings, whether they're office buildings or residential buildings, uh, are being designed by American architects, in, sometimes in collaboration with Indian, Indian firms as well. When you look at law firms, though, I, I have to double check this, but the last time I looked, I think Indian, that foreign companies, foreign law firms weren't permitted to act directly on the ground in India. Uh, so uh, I haven't checked that recently, but I have certainly haven't seen any evidence of the large law firms opening offices in India, so perhaps that is still the case. Uh, again, if you drop that question to me in email, I can I can answer that for you. There are instances of U.S. IP law firms providing services to Indian companies while they are based here in the U.S. Uh, they can provide so you know if, if an Indian company has a question about about IP, about global IP, about entering the U.S. market, about buying a company here, uh, and, and so that kind of business is happening. I've seen many instances of that. But in terms of setting up an office in India and addressing Indian customers in India, that's the part that I, I want to be hesitant about. OK, great. Um, thanks, Anjan. Um, we also have a question from um, Mr. Huang, who's asking, um, India seems to have the most difficult custom rules for business. Do you see a chance for change in India over the next few years? Yes, so if you go back to pre-1991 when India began its liberalization journey, customs rule at that, rules at that point were so onerous that many, many Indian companies didn't want to import any product, many Western companies didn't want to deal with India at all. Duties and procedures were simplified greatly in the three or four years following the beginning of liberalization in 1991, and that's what led to the growth of the Indian economy that we have seen over the last several years. Now, India has a new government. I didn't refer to that so far, but in, in May last year, India elected its most business-friendly government ever. And this new government, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, is extremely committed to simplifying uh, the uh, procedures and the customs duties and taxes and so on. Now, this is going to happen over a course of years. And simplification does not necessarily mean elimination of duties. So I'm sure, just as we have many other countries, whether it's Brazil or, uh, or, or China, there are the reasons that people will want to have some kind of duty and tax structure for imported products. Uh, sometimes it's simply to equalize uh, against a domestic excise duty or production duty. Sometimes it is to encourage domestic manufacturing. So there will, you know, I, I, I think if someone wants to wait until duties and taxes are eliminated, they are, uh, that is a strategy that I would challenge. But yes, we do expect things to get simpler and the unnecessary and unpredictable delays at customs. That has been a big problem. Uh, and we expect that the, if the new government is able to execute on some of its promises, that those kinds of things should start getting simpler. We've already seen some impact, not so much in customs duties, but certainly in visas. American citizens need a visa to go to India. And it used to be a painful and erratic process. It has gotten much better now. I always advise our clients to apply for a five-year business visa when they are going on business to India. And that used to get, sometimes they would only get a one-year visa. Sometimes it would take weeks to come through. And we've seen in the last few months since the new government uh, came to power that uh, the grinding of business visas has become much more productive and efficient. And virtually everybody I know who has, uh, who was born in this country and has applied for a five-year visa has been granted one. So, uh, so that that's a good thing. Now, tourists will have a capability of visa on arrival. I won't get into that because this is a business-oriented webinar. Customs duties and taxes, I think, will take a little while longer, uh, but we expect good things. So, Gunjan, we are actually ten minutes uh, past our uh, scheduled uh, end time. Uh, we still have a few questions. Uh, would you like to do those uh, offline uh, via email? Well, so let's do this. Let's. Let's, why don't you formally close the webinar? I can stay on for another three or four minutes. Okay. But uh, for people who want to exit, if you want to explain how the exit uh, questionnaire works. Okay. Thank you. 
so thank you everyone for attending the webinar today and for being a very interactive audience. That's always a pleasure. Uh, we hope the session was informative. If you have any additional questions, please do email us at usa at amrit.com. Uh, again, that's usa at amrit.com. As you exit the webinar, uh, you will uh, be closing the webinar applet and be asked to complete a brief survey. And we would really appreciate your feedback on the webinar today. If you have any friends or colleagues who you think might benefit from a similar webinar, please have them register on our website, www.amrit.com, and we will notify them of any upcoming webinars. Thank you so much for attending today, and have a nice day. And for folks who would like to stay on, we will continue with the Q&A session. Thank you. OK, Supriya. OK. Um, so um, we have a question from uh, Mani who's asking, generally, what kind of a business model has worked in India, starting your own office, joint venture, or other model? In terms of percentages, what has generally been more successful and why? Yeah, it's a great question. And we often get asked these kinds of broad questions. Uh, each of those approaches that money outlined has succeeded in India for various customers. So I, I think it's, it's not so meaningful to look at percentages uh, other, other than if you're an Indian government bureaucrat. You really have to look at your particular business. If you are, if you are in the consumer product business, chances are you're going to want to set up an operation in India if you're going to have, if your sales objectives are over $50 million, you're not going to be doing this remotely. But, but you could, on the other hand, be a niche supplier and your aims for India are 10 or $20 million. Maybe you can do that through, through a distribution model uh, importing product into India. Um, if you, uh, there are certain industries where the Indian, Indian law or Indian duties almost dictate a presence on the ground to be competitive, uh, to, to be able to avoid duties or to be able to use Indian labor. You know, in, in that case, it, you, know, you, you don't really don't want to go to the to the route where you will be priced out of the market or your response time will be too slow or too long. So I, I think you really have to look at uh, your particular business uh, and the nature of the Indian market and discover the engagement between the two. There are no, uh, broadly speaking, there are no limitations why you have to set up a, a wholly owned subsidiary or a joint venture like they used to be in China where sometimes you couldn't even do business unless you did that. So those kind of situations are very limited, such as defense and so on. And even there, they've started to liberalize. OK, what else? And then we have a question. I think this could be the final one um, from Devashish um, asking, can you please indicate any trend of custom duties and taxes on imported industrial goods from the USA? Will it be favorable? So far, the government hasn't indicated a particular intent to favor any country over another. There are anti-dumping duties that they may impose on certain countries. The US has not been subject to those, as far as I know, for any product. Uh, those have been typically applied against China and a couple of other countries. Um, I have not seen a specific intent to say that we are going to lower customs duties and taxes uh, for a particular category. Uh, so I, I would. I don't think I can point to specific examples of that. I, you know, I certainly we will see that happen over time. But right now, the government is much more committed to the idea of simplifying the processes and to passing this new uniform tax across the country called the Goods and Services Tax, which in India will require a constitutional amendment. And so I think for the next few months, that's where their focus will be. There will be a financial budget announced in February in India. It's an annual event, and it's watched by every Indian on, on television and online. And uh, the new finance minister uh, will probably have some of his policies being, you know, coming into action. So at that point, we will know uh, what they're going to do, at least for the fiscal year that starts on April 1st. So I would say stay tuned. Uh, it's an event that we will cover in our blog, theindiaexpert.com, and I will probably tweet about it live. So that's a good point, good time to be able to get more specific information. Uh, at this point, uh, between December and February, the government is very close mouth and very secretive about the decisions they've made in, in this budget, which might affect taxes and duties and so on. I, I, would, I would say that in, any rumors you hear are just that, rumors. 
uh, there have been no official pronouncements as far as I know. Okay. Well, we should uh, we should call it a day for this webinar then. Yes. I've really enjoyed uh, interacting with each of you, and I look forward to personal interactions with those of you who would like in the future. Great. Thank you, Gunjan, and thank you again, everyone, for attending today. Uh, again, if there were any questions uh, that you still had, feel free to send us an email, usa at amrit.com, and we look forward to um, interacting with you in the future. Thank you, and have a good day. Goodbye.